<sighs> so, Dean, what does collapse mean to you? Um, I'm assuming that you're you're asking, you know, in the in the context of what we're experiencing now around the world, and so that it means uh, primarily means for me the human caused um, disruption, uh, derogatory disruption of both human and earth systems. That's the kind of short version I use, but. I imagine you might be asking more than that. We were just talking about where you live. Where do you live and have you had experiences there that fall into this category? Sure. Um, we've, uh, I live in Southern Oregon, in Medford, Oregon, which uh, most people know this area from a smaller town nearby called Ashland, which has a world famous uh, tourist attraction, the uh, Shakespeare Festival that they do every year and so on. Quite well known for all that. Um, and one of the extreme weather events and um, having to do with some amount of what's often called climate change or that, that human caused elements at a larger scale uh, we, in, in the firestorm that we had last September, uh, about 10,000 people were put out of their homes and rentals and uh, we're still rebuilding and and I, I believe it's going to be fun be fundamentally uh, shifting this valley to being less and less affordable by people in both the rental and the ownership market which might sound like drilling down into too much detail here but it's it's a massive thing like I I predict that in my old guy lifetime, whatever years I have left, I don't think I'll see another year of relative affordability for, for people below, um, below, certainly below living wage, but that wasn't true. That was unaffordable for them anyway. So now I imagine that it's creeping up the uh, income level at which it's still going to be virtually impossible to afford to live here. And what consequence does that have? Well, you know, I, I guess I could suggest it for anybody for whom they, they have a question about that, uh, they could look at Aspen, Colorado, which has a quite a visible history of decades of having to deal with how do we have one of the most expensive chunks of real estate on the planet with the billionaires live there or they have their fifth home there. And for all, all the service people, all the regular people who run stuff, um, they have to live two, three, four, five in a home or an apartment and find other ways to survive, scratch out a, a survival living. And they have done a pretty pretty great job of, of coming up with alternative, less costly housing and so on. Uh, but it has taken decades and it has taken a committed effort by people who have been very, very sincere in doing that. And I, I severely doubt that there are many places here in the United States that will have that level of concern, that level of focused, sustained effort to really make it work for people who are making less money. Um, and I, I just predict that this will happen one way or another, whether it's fire or um, e e uh, economic inequity and so on. There are so many different ways that both human and earth systems can be either stressed to an exceptional level or just fully collapse that, um, that will be an extraordinary challenge for any community to come up with anything meaningful because it's different in the, the past 30 years that Aspen's been working on it, they haven't had to worry about collapse of earth and human systems on top of it all. So what, yeah. what, do, you, what do you expect to deal with, you, per, you yourself personally? Well, I'm uh, just so blessed. You know, I'm a white male, uh, privileged in innumerable ways. 
and uh, that shows up in where I'm sitting, you know, and and how comfortable I am. And my my economic footprint is pretty low. My you know carbon footprint's pretty low, and I don't have many more years to live. So I I don't predict um, a lot of impact. I don't think it's going to be no impact. Uh, really, we've had fire weather warnings here for the past two weeks, and we're just at the beginning of summer. Um, so I, this is the West Coast plague now, as you know, and so there's a huge amount I have no idea, but I'm not, uh, you know, a 25-year-old young man trying to get things going and starting up in a career and trying to see, you know, do I go to college? Do I pursue a usual corporate track? Um, if I were on that track at that point, um, I would have immense questions of what the hell do I do, you know, compared to the usual ideas of what a young man would do and so on. So I don't know what's coming my way. Uh, and I'm doing my best to put together a powerful set of tools for my work with others um, so that they might be able to answer those questions for themselves in a good way. What kind of tools are you making? Well, I, it isn't, uh, they're certainly not all of them of my making. Uh, there are some uh, that I've been gathering them for really my whole lifetime is because I've been working in the field of transformational or transformation-based training in both the corporate and personal development realms. And uh, as soon as I, really had my woke moment, so to speak, and, and uh, went about researching and writing my book uh, of 2017, The Impossible Conversation, I saw that this is truly the impossible conversation. You know, we're a culture, a global culture that just has no capacity whatsoever to be present at the level that's that's called for. So I, I saw that what there was to do was to serve life in the best way I could with my particular view is that we're facing many predicaments, not just challenges and problems. And so in predicaments, there are no solutions. So what, they're, what we get to do is to be as powerful, as alive, as related, as connected, as vibrant as we can in the face of those predicaments. And those are the kind of tools that range from self-regulation and co-regulation at the kind of first aid level to the more and more advanced, more and more in-depth psycho-spiritual practices that uh, would be at a, at a higher level on the gradient scale of, you know, how uh, engaged do I want to be on an existential level, a spiritual level? Um, that, that's what I would call that spectrum from kind of a first aid, just being rocked by the incidents in my life and not having much agency to that more engaged and more uh, agency involved uh, level. Yeah. You mentioned your woke moment. What was mm. that like? Well, it was really the, the most recent in a chain of them that started uh, somewhere around the vicinity of 10 years old for me when I would watch Jacques Cousteau specials on Sunday night and I would see this beautiful world and his message would include, if you look over here, this is the damage that's being done by humans in this gorgeous area. And if it continues, this whole reef will die and you know, he'll say whatever he says. And I noticed that I was the only person in tears during that part. And I also noticed, um, you know, certainly was just 10 years old, but it didn't take Einstein to figure out nobody's doing anything about those things. And they're promising to get just worse. So that was probably my first woke moment. And there were a number of them throughout my adult life. And then this most recent one, approximately 10 years ago, uh, was to just see that not only is there climate change as one of as, you know, 10 years ago, that was sort of a still fledgling issue that was starting to gain some prominence. 
but it was then that I heard about abrupt climate change, something far more intense and far more accelerated than uh, anything that regular climate change conversations ever included. And so that's when I had it. And that, um, I don't know if you want more detail about what that, what spilled out from there, but that's when I had that woke moment, if you will. You mentioned being the only one in tears. It seems like there's often <clears throat> it seems like there's often a feeling of isolation among people who are aware of the predicament that we face. Do you feel isolated? There are certainly times when, and there, there have been times throughout my life when um, it ranged from just occasional sadness and grief and, and loneliness uh, to full on, like I, I've been born into a planet I don't relate, I can't relate to. Like what is going, where, where am I? I, st I get those kind of messages internally ab about every, well, in the past four years in particular, I've had those on a daily basis, but it, that's a whole nother story. Um, hmm. Hmm. Is there another aspect to that direction of that, that question that I could? Well, I have the same, I often have the same question, like, where am I? What, what is this place? What is this experience? I think it's a very deep inquiry. Mm -hmm. uh, I wonder if you have uh, found fruitful paths mm -hmm along that, that line of inquiry. Yeah, I have. And I, I really have my, my long-standing practices, personal practices to thank for not just helping me make, you know, sense making uh, progress in, in these times, but also to just keep me alive at various points in my life. Um, and that though, basically, uh, many of my practices were kind of built on that existential kind of baseline, meaning, you know, none of us get out of here alive. And so a lot of the, um, my practices come from a shamanic background or an energetics background or a transformation based background. And each of those is pretty good at telling the truth, you know, kind of like a samurai sword of like, let's be real here. And from that, place, um, there's a, there's really a commitment to what's true. And in these times of fake news and alternative realities and everything being relative and everything being polarized to, to such a remarkable degree, that the truth is actually held in disdain now. It is actually fuel for our tribalism with each other. And um, basically, my work is to um, invite people into an environment where they can create enough of return to a sense of center in their lives, a sense of agency, which I would assert that our culture takes very early on from all of us. And so that's the work that I'm doing in my own practices. And that's the work that I'm doing in my work. The sense of agency, uh, that's come up a couple times for me recently. Of what does agency consist? Or when you have agency, what do you have? Well, um, let me put it in terms of what I was just talking about when I'm in my own work, my own practices, and then the work that I'm doing with others is um, the core of my work is called just practices of reconnection asserting that what got us into these predicaments is that we've disconnected from all the primary sources of meaning and relationship in a human life. And so if I get out of bed in the morning and I realize we're in a predicament and I know that disconnection got us here, what can I do? Because I'd like to do something that makes the world just a little bit better before I go to bed tonight. It has to start, just from my point of view, it has to start with practices of reconnection. 
mine will be different than yours, but we can bring the bring ours together in circle with others. And we can then share those practices and we can especially hold space for each other and be of service to each other in the practices that, that require another person. And so with regard to agency, if a person doesn't have their center, if they have been disconnected from all those primary sources of meaning, uh, that one of those, one of the costs of those disconnections is a deep disempowerment, is lack of agency. Agency gets sucked out. And um, so part of the practices of reconnection for almost everyone at the beginning levels of this work is to uh, be able to call back in a sense of my own center, both physically and mentally and, and uh, emotionally and so on, so that I can start to feel, have a felt sense of I have meaning, the, when my way of in, in being with the world has meaning and I am able to relate in a wholesome, good way, those elements naturally exude a sense of agency when a person is is back in in that in that saddle, so to speak, back in that seat, uh, without that seat, without that reconnection to center, there is no agency, and there's a helplessness and there's a reactivity of someone like an adolescent who just does, has no idea and is just flailing, and that the effect of the reactionary, inflamed emotions that'll come up every few minutes and. Yeah, we know how that goes. <laughs> Can you describe a basic practice? I mean, not to instruct it now, but what kind of thing are you talking about? Well, probably at the simplest level, it's to just acknowledge that progression that I was just saying. You know, what got us here is disconnection. And if I want to be a, a, a person who makes a difference in, in my day, I best reconnect. And so to just have those realizations and, and orient myself toward gathering those practices over time, just that makes a huge difference. Um, the, there are certain elements that are certainly, they're no surprise. This is what I meant by I'm, I'm not the guy who came up with so many of them like just about any contemplative practice is a good foundation point, is a good starting point to start to get a sense of some discernment of who am I? Am I my emotions, my thoughts? And so what those quieter practices, the meditative practices are so good at is allowing us a, a few moments each day of being able to discern I am not those thoughts going through. I am not those emotions that are so roiling up because I had the argument with my boss. No, 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 no. So it's just starting at those very basic levels of self-awareness, discernment, being able to see, you know, where where might I look if I were looking for my truth in a in a truly uh, internally referent way which I would assert that the vast majority of us are so externally referent. You know, this entire social media reality that we now call normal is entirely externally referent. So there is no center. There is no truth to find in here. And there, hence, there is no meaning to find in here. And it's kind of a, a dismal cycle of less and less meaning, less and less connection. So if you find yourself, you find meaning. Um, it seems to be part of the part of the deal. <laughs> yeah. So you said uh, that the things you said about. Uh, meditation or practices to find the center and let go of the identification with thoughts. That resonates with me. Here's a question about that. If I discover that I am not my thoughts and I am not my 
transient feelings, then who am I? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's, that is definitely a question way above my pay grade. Um, but I can give you the answer that I've come up with on my own for myself and that I am um, as much as I can muster these days and for quite a while in my practices, the, the more present I can be in any given moment, the more I can identify with my experience in this moment. I don't mean to be vague there or weird in the words I'm using, but that's where I have found the most valuable uh, insights and also um, direct experience of beingness, of uh, meaning in the moment, uh, of vibrant aliveness is in that direct experience in the moment. Is it be here now? Yes, I mean, you know, that's funny. That was my very first uh, book, my first uh, step into psycho-spiritual practices back when, you know, it was, it was fresh off the presses. <laughs> that's how old I am. Um, and, you know, one of the kind of commonly used phrases in, in this circle, in this, in this work is, you know, what we're, trying to bring forth is an expansion, a, a deliberately created um, expansion of capacity to be present in the face of larger and larger stressors. Because uh, every way I look, uh, the stressors of our world are promising to get larger and larger still. And um, as simple as that sounds, that, that's like, I can't imagine a more important skill to have or if we're going to be of service to our children or to our neighbors or to our loved ones, our spouse, our coworkers, or people in our community uh, and ourselves is how can I be, be more and more present in the face of larger and larger stressors? And whatever answers I come up with in my practices will translate at least somewhat in my conversations with uh, with my child or my spouse or you know and so on, yeah. What does it feel like to be a shaman in the age of collapse? Yeah, I I'm wary of using the word shaman because it the the appropriation issue that's so alive these days, um, I, I just wouldn't call myself that because I don't give a shit. Excuse me, I don't care about using that term. But I think I know what you're pointing at and I, I identify with what I think you're pointing at. And uh, that is someone who uh, has some direct experience of exploring other dimensions, other ways of being, other ways of relating with other people, with my own deeper self, with earth herself and with soul. And I do have those direct experiences and I can call on them and I do to be able to share those practices and those experiences with others. And um, it's extraordinarily humbling because I have absolutely no uh, in attention on and no agenda about um, outcome. You know, while I'm doing this work and it's the most deeply existential and largest scale work I've ever, I couldn't have imagined it 10 years ago. Um, It's so tempting in our world, which is all outcome-based, which is all transactional, which is all um, extraordinarily thin in relatedness and extraordinarily thick in uh, what's in it for me kind of agendas going on. Um, what I can say is it is humbling. 
and it is such a privilege to be with people as as they take on their own healing and exploring their own dynamics of what got them into this place and what had them forfeit their agency and their center and and those levels of healing they're they're literally there's so much beauty it's i'm going to just slow down for a moment So I'm just slowing down because I found myself, I was in my head and I was trying to answer your question. And, and that's such a small piece of what I'm trying to convey. And so in slowing down, I cued myself to feel at a much deeper level and share with you in a much deeper level. And I, I really can't imagine anything more important or good or healing or just sweet to be a part of is when any of us um, shares space with one another to explore uh, those sources of meaning, those um, ways of expanding our capacity to be present, even when it's very uncomfortable to expand that capacity. And it can be very uncomfortable it's a privilege and it's so much beauty. You said that 10 years ago, you couldn't imagine your current practices or capacity to be present. What changed? Actually, what I was saying I couldn't imagine was doing work at this scale, like who my audience is or what I perceive the the realm in which this work is relevant is truly global. And I've, you know, I've done some pretty good work with some pretty big training companies and big organizations and so on, but nothing bigger than like AT&T. <laughs> you know? So to go to the global level and to go to the existential level, I could never have imagined that I would be offering anything that could be in any way useful at that scale. And uh, so that's what I meant by that. Uh, <clears throat> I'm gonna close the window. Mm -hmm. Just in case. <clears throat> what is the offering that you're making nowadays? Um, well, after uh, that woke moment and the writing, the researching and writing of the book, which told the story about that woke moment and the researching and vetting of these existential predicaments. Um, again, I, I just chose to give up the whole corporate and all the other expressions and go into being of service to, to life. And ironically, really, I put humanity fourth or fifth down the list when I say I'm in service to life, but it happens to be who I interact with most. And so uh, I put together a website and have some online uh, training and, and uh, support materials, support meetings, uh, gatherings, uh, coaching, and then, uh, you know, I really have a good time. I really have enjoyed um, putting together this podcast that I've been doing for more than five years now uh, called The Poetry of Predicament, which is a YouTube channel. And um, particularly for the past couple of years, I've been really focusing on speaking with exemplars, people who have in, in their practices, in their way of leaning into this, this daunting future, they have some way of bringing truly the transform transformative something in their, what they have chosen in their practices and in their presence uh, is transformative. And uh, that can seem odd, I think, to many of the people who watch my podcast, because uh, 
it, they just don't make sense and they're not famous and you know they're not uh, Charles Eisenstein and they're not you know blah 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 um, but I I grew up with a very different notion of what's transformative versus what's change versus what are the built-in resistance factors on the individual and the collective level that keep us from even changing, much less transforming. So I, I noticed in how you're introducing this, this interview series that you're doing, talking about transformation, my experience of transformation is that it has been commodified just as a term, it's been commodified like so much else in our world. And um, in my lineage, I don't say I've got the right scoop, but the, I was taught, and it's certainly my experience, the transformation is not messing around. It is not something that just happens to happen when you change enough stuff in a cool way or decide to be really transformed now. It's like, you know, I just keep looking at the butterfly coming out of the caterpillar and that is not messing around. That is not a comfortable experience just to watch. And my experience of transform transformation is that it is something that is not for the faint of heart. And uh, it is not necessarily always positive and super good. And life is so much better when it, it, you know, it's all transformed. Um, so it's, again, it's a, it's a more complicated issue than, than is often talked about. Um, and it is something that I have learned over time how to invite some amount of transformative experience into a space. If I'm working with a coaching client or myself or a room full of people. And it's something that I, even though I've had tremendous numbers of years of experience with it, um, I don't know if it's going to show up. And I don't know what it'll turn into in the direct experience of each person involved. So uh, I hope that wasn't too much of a sidetrack that took it off, no, off that's base, fine. but yeah. What is hard about transformation? Well, I, th I think we're in a culture that is so um, adverse to self-knowledge, adverse to being introspective, adverse to being connected with the earth, so disconnected from each other and from earth, um, that we, um, we have no idea collectively that we are literally killing massive hunks of our collective habitat shared habitat around the world. This is far more important in my book right now in, in terms of urgency than anything about climate change. And we just don't talk about it. You know, we, we know that there's this book called Sixth Mass Extinction and great. So I'm at dinner time and say, pass, pass the butter. You know, there's where it's so conversational. It has no impact. It, we have no way of resonating with our real impact on our original mother and on ourselves and on our fellow more than human earthlings. Um, so how transformation can be difficult is before you can even dream about, even mention the word transformation, a person's got to have the ability to find what is true, what is really going on, what is the like razor's edge reality of our impact on this planet. And most of us have a tiny thimble full of capacity for that conversation. Even those of us in the collapse aware community, even the doomers, even the ones who doom scroll all day long have a tiny capacity to actually feel what that means, to really let it into our system in a way that resonates that resonance alone, just most people below circuits. So transformation requires an awful lot beyond that. And the level of discomfort doesn't get any easier from that initial blowing of circuits. It just gets more demanding, more challenging to crack ourselves open at the next level and the next level of 
appropriate levels of grief and appropriate levels of really being responsible as a being amongst other beings in a web of life. And so I hope that wasn't too uh, long and obscure a response. No, no, it's, I think you're getting at something very central and very important. The path you describe, though, doesn't sound very pleasant. It sounds arduous, difficult, hard, terrifying. Why would anyone do it? Yeah, it's a, such a good question. I really appreciate you asking that. Do uh, you remember a few minutes ago that I, I had to slow myself down? I found myself in a rapid fire, heady, uh, linear way of describing the, some answer to your question. And, and I, it was just so inappropriate. And what I did was cue myself into an, a, a very different, I would call this the implicit system or implicit senses in my body, in my world, which goes from about the base of my neck down to my perineum. And this is where we get inspired when we're standing with someone we love at the sunset and we're moved, we're moved from here. When we're having an orgasm, we're moved from here. When we have a deep sense of grief and loss, it comes from here, you get the idea. And what I've found is we have come to normalize a way of being alive that is flatline. We call this life. We've normalized this amount of life when a, a fully alive human being would have a massive amount more bandwidth, more highs and more lows more resonance with life in extraordinary levels out to the intergalactic and down to the microscopic and so on. There's a massive expansion of aliveness that's available, but only if one is willing to do that cracking open, that grieving, that opening that I was talking about before. And it's a bit difficult to describe because most of us listen from that tiny bandwidth as well. And the sales pitch isn't particularly, doesn't care much. If a person can't hear it, this look at the wisdom traditions for thousands of years, when the few people who have committed their lives to those extraordinary Satori level experiences, it hasn't been for everybody. So it's a hard, hard question to answer in a way that can be heard by someone who's listening to what's being said from here and living their life from here. I hope that's clear. If a person does hear the call, why would they embark on such an arduous path? Yeah. Um, you know, that that's, isn't that the question about the whole hero's journey idea, the whole mythopoetic idea of what makes a life worth living? What gets us out of bed in the morning? And what, um, what seems to be consistent through all the versions of those stories is that uh, at some point a person is initiated into a, a truly adult level of being alive and willing to be sourced from, really motivated by something far larger than themselves, than the rather small version that we learn as an adolescent, which our culture is an adolescent. So it is a tough question you're asking because our culture is so tightly gripped on all the elements of that adolescent expression. And so it takes an extraordinary amount of courage for any of us, male, female, old, young, a huge courage to crack out of this business as usual culture to just first get just a little bit of air, you know, air, um, above water 
to be able to get a sense of that there is something outside of what we call normal. And so um, I don't have an easy answer for you. And But what I can say is it takes immense courage for anyone who chooses that path. My uh, original woke moment in this regard involved an enormous amount of fear. I was literally chased down the street by my imagination of an apocalyptic moment that would destroy me. And I literally ran down a street in a small Midwestern town where I was living and had all manner of adventures, story for another day. So my question is about fear. Fear seems to be a motivator if you are willing to let it move you, I guess I would say. So I should ask you a question. What role has, does fear play in your practice or your current life? Mm -hmm. Um, I have certainly had my share of immersion in the business as usual culture, which is heavily engaged with fear. So it's everywhere all the time. Um, I have been in practices uh, for decades of being able to transmute, to fully experience a much larger, fuller, more wholesome range of each of the emotions, including fear. And then the advanced version of those practices is what we, we can transmogrify, we can shift, we can transform, if you will, those from something to fear or something you know, that's causing anger. I can be far more responsible for that upwelling. I can sh volitionally shift it into something that is a motivator, something that is a clear ally in the process of being alive in this moment, doing what I'm doing, rather than being at the effect of it, which I was an angry young man for, and, and hyper intense for all of my first 30 plus years. And it has taken immense uh, practices to learn how to make those shifts, those uh, transformations of, uh, emotions and feelings from something to be at the effect of or to, to be avoided or suppressed and turning them into fully expressed allies. On the flip side of fear is love. Uh, the same episode that drove me down the street fleeing fear drew me with an irresistible attraction toward love, an insane love, a love that squashed mm. my entire being. Mm. Oh, uh, that sounds good. Good, yes, but it burned me just as bad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, where is love in your universe? Mm. I'd love to hear more of, of your story and what you're describing as both the highs and lows oh, got I'm expanded to an excruciating level. It's not unfamiliar territory and I'd love to hear sometime when we have a cup of tea together. Um, love, the, the quick and easy version of it is the, going back to that same orientation to as, as direct an experience of being present in the moment as possible being there. I don't have to figure it out. I don't have to invite anything. I don't have to have mastered the eight steps of anything. Love is present. Love is present. I, I have gotten that for quite a while. And, and having started out my, my exploration of that whole, like, what is this psycho-spiritual world uh, and all of the mystical traditions, all the wisdom traditions talk about love being there. And for some of us, that's an easy connection to make. 
And for many of us, it takes a lot of work, a lot of getting everything else out of the way. So that's I, what I would say in the short version. This is actually touching a very pertinent question that is central to my I'm going to slow down now, too. Thank you. Good call. Good pause. <clears throat> well, I find you're touching on a lot of things that are very important to me as well, mm -hmm. questions that, that I seek to answer. You talk about immediate experience, being there. I, I think I know what you mean, or I know about it from my point of view, what happens yeah. to me. But here's the question. There, there are some kinds of knowledge or wisdom or realization that I have gained through direct experience. Mm -hmm. uh, in my case, I used to employ pharmaceutical substances to help induce altered states of consciousness. No more. Yep. But I used to. Mm -hmm. And many revelations occurred in those altered states. And the, the conundrum that I wonder about is, is it possible really to teach any of that or to convey, even if not teaching, but to convey any of that separate from people's actual own experience of their own and if you have to experience it why are we talking why do we talk at all uh, so can you learn anything except by your own experience yeah my quick answer is i don't know my second answer is that it's part of our direct experience is when we're present, like right now. And you and I are sharing our experience and we're sharing information with one another. And if I'm truly present to you at the level you and I have both talked about, I'm slowing down again intentionally and I'm connecting with you best I can right in this moment. And I am, I have cued myself to be in primarily sensing from this implicit senses area that I was talking about. And that's a part of, I have also a, quite an extensive history with using substances of various kinds, plant medicine primarily to access these powerful other ways of being and so on. Those also centrally occur in the implicit senses. So my assertion is, and really has been since early on in those plant medicine times, that there are ways to do that without the plant medicines. And there are ways to do that with each other. And sometimes that will involve sharing some words. Sometimes it won't. One thing that came to mind, you were asking for some examples of practices of reconnection, kind of at the that's advanced level that you're, you're pointing to now. Uh, one of those attributes of those plant medicine times is my experience of this world around me. It would take on a liquidity. Things that were rigid without the plant medicine became quite um, morphic changing liquid and far less discerned boundaries and th that can be an excruciating experience if a person experiences it outside of plant medicine if any in any way that that kind of liquidity that kind of uh, experience of that morphing is almost immediately interpreted through fear of losing control in a person's mind and, and in our culture, in this business as usual culture, 
And that is something to be deeply feared. That uncertainty, that mystery is not our friend in the business as usual world. And so one practice, one element of the practices that I uh, talk about in, in this work is um, being able to discern and then actually learn to appreciate and lean into a, a self-generated liquid state. So um, I hope that fits as a response to what you were asking. I think it does. You've used a word that I haven't heard anyone else use but that I recognize, and that is responsibility. Mm -hmm. What does that mean to you in this context? Um, I'll be as brief as I can. I, I only know really how to speak about it in terms of being able to respond, being responsible. If I don't have my center, if I have forfeited my center quite early on, and so I'm going through this life without a center, without so much of that which would give me an accurate way of perceiving and interacting with the world, there's no way I can be responsible. There's no way I can actually respond in a way that is conscious uh, with anything. And that's the normal state of our world right now. So is it possible that we're in kind of a chaotic world right now in which there are many things just spinning out of control and things seem not only chaotic, but violent. And we use words like extinction and catastrophe like every day and so on. I think this is a, a way that we can describe a culture and an individual who had forfeited their center and hence unable to really accurately sense what's going on around them, unable to sense what their impact is, they can't be responsible for something they literally have lost contact with. Well, I uh, am amazed and gratified that mm. we have managed to explore some rather esoteric territory. And yeah. I just love it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, he, here's a simpler question or a simpler approach that I've had to actually cope with recently. Let's say you run across someone online, maybe a slightly younger person or a very much younger person. Uh, let's say you run across someone online who is sad, despairing, afraid, alone, just in a bad place. And they look at the world they see chaos, impending disaster, death and fire and all the horrors that are part of the story now. Mm -hmm. What do you say to such a person? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, having worked for most of my adult life in a number of different training uh, situations, one of which consistently was working, uh, training adults to work with troubled youth in cities in the USA and the UK. And consistently the process that we would do in this intensive transformation-based work with them is to first and foremost, really first to create some kind of safe container so that they can feel this, this container can hold me. So in a simple conversation with this person you're talking about, I would do my best to just offer an open space of being able to say, I, I welcome you expressing yourself. 
I'm wel I welcome if you're if you have anger or if you're sad or you have tears or if you're um, fearful and, and so on. And there's something about first just that to be held in that way to have space held is something that many of us just don't get as children at all. Um, then after a certain amount of being able to feel safe telling their truth, there's the exploration of, are you interested in hearing about, if not this despair, if not this cruel world that you're describing, that you're so daunted by, would you be interested in hearing about how it doesn't need to, it doesn't have to be this way? Could we explore some other ways that it could be with no promise whatsoever that these existential issues, these extinction possibilities and so on, I have no answers for you, this person that I'm talking to, but to explore I love how Charles Eisenstein says it, it, you know, this more beautiful world our hearts know is possible. I know that part of me really well. I've had that little boy inside of me since Jacques Cousteau watching all those years ago. I knew that there is a more beautiful world that my heart knows is possible, but I can see that we're not headed there. And instead of being immersed in the sadness, the despair of that we're not headed there, there's a way to tap into what you and I have touched, touched into just briefly here, which is in the direct experience of the moment, held in a container, container of being, you know, held, space being held by conscious others and ideally conscious elders as well. There is that direct experience of deep inspiration, the inspiration of what it is to be present to this miracle, David, that that we are in this moment now able to speak with one another over this unbelievable machinery. And we're able to connect. I can feel you and hopefully you can feel me. And we are blessed to be alive at this extraordinary time, possibly the only place in the known universe with this kind of life. And we have this moment and now this one. It seems like a kind of a shitty deal when you're listening from that thin flat line hyper sales oriented place that we all call normal. But for a person who's just cracked their heart open and been held while they've expressed their fear and their sadness and their anger, um, it starts to sound like a pretty, pretty good thing. Thank you for that. Hmm. One last question, and it's an experimental question. Do you think everyone can get there? I don't. Mm -mm. I think extraordinarily few people will even have this conversation and this level of, you know, mostly hearing it kind of in a heady way, content wise and so on, much less having the full bandwidth experience that you and I are pointing at. Um, I think it'll be a tiny fragment of humanity that ever has had this conversation or that ever will. And I guess I can point back, you know, to whole cultures over thousands of years that had far more direct experience of the moment, just built into how they, how they did it for those thousands of years. But there's, uh, there are very few left on the planet that are, have that built-in culture. And very, very few of us have the space, the bandwidth to even imagine 
the kind of presence uh, that you and I are talking about. And what happens to the rest of the people? The same thing that's happening, gonna happen to you and me. We'll eventually die. And having lived a, a full life, hopefully, and a beautiful life, and and there's so much beauty in daily life at whatever level somebody's on. There's not some magic, you know, better ticket ride that I might have over somebody else. It's we're all doing the best we can. So we're all going to do the best we can till the day we drop. And my senses, unfortunately, um, I think our predicaments, our self-caused predicaments will take us down. Yes, I happen to agree. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm going to stop the recording.